one of the secrets of our success is we did an IPO very early on. And when I was doing that, I wasn't writing code or uh, doing things. I, so I spent a lot of my time um, uh, hiring people and making sure we had great people driving the business all the time. And if there was something I kind of had to do, it meant that I hadn't hired someone in to do that role. So um, I think a really key thing was always working on the business, not in the business. And so that allows you to really focus on strategy. So what I kind of would do during the day, and I was traveling quite a lot, I, I was always on social. So I was watching what was being said about the business, what was going on. So you kind of have your finger on the pulse. And you're always looking to see things that are inconsistent with the vision of, of success. So a lot of it was walking around, talking, talking to customers, because I knew that the operating part of the business had, had people that were driving that. So I was really watching what was going on, heads up. Um, and I I'd, I'd, um, always talking to customers, always presenting, responding to people on social and dealing with issues that were coming up rather than day-to-day -day operational things. And so what I'd do is I'd find I wouldn't actually do a lot of actual work during the day. I was really just talking and um, working out things. Then I'd have spurts of time where I felt really motivated to just go in and, and I'd power work for like an hour or two, often quite late at night, just getting things done and catching up with things. So yeah, I was very much working on the business, not in the business. And I was always hiring, getting new talent and just firefighting. Well, you answered one of the questions that I was that I was going to write down was what are what were those times that you were able to set aside to get that proactive work done? And you said often it was late at night. Yeah, so I'm really unstructured. Um, I'm 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 organized in terms of what I want the business to achieve, but for work practices, I'm the worst. It's like when I feel like it, and if I'm um, if I'm not in the mood, I'm procrastinating. I'm doing everything else. But then sometimes the guilt just um, just gets on top of you and you need to just power work out. So I'm very much um, inspirational about that. One of the really big things I found that was important was making time to exercise every day. And when I was home, I was living in Havelock North quite a bit of it. Um, and uh, when, I, when I wasn't traveling and we, and we, had, a, we had a hill, Tomato Peak, that I used to try to ride my bike up at lunchtime. And... Um, and you know, what I love about bike riding is that you're thinking about, especially going up a hill, you're thinking about every corner. It forces you to not think about work. And every time um, coming down the hill, I'd have just all the pieces, the, your, your back brain's done its work. And there'd be five or, three, or 10 things or problems that you hadn't even realized were problems that you've solved in your head without thinking about them. So I'd always have a hyperproductive spurt. I remember I'd get back off my bike I'd be on the keyboard, sweat dripping down on it, actually just firing off 10 emails because that um, thinking time or doing something else so you, your brain has time to process became a big part of it. And then I'd have usually have a really productive spurt um, after some exercise where I just solved a bunch of problems and, and fire things off. That's that's awesome. Well, when the, one of my next questions was going to be, what time management practices have been central to your success? And it sounds like taking care of your health and having normal exercise practices are a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm really unstructured and I hate schedules. Like I resist them as much as possible. So like I'm the worst. So, um, but being really clear on outcomes, like I hate meetings and you know, other than social thing of going to a meeting, but that's usually fun for five minutes. So if like if, if we're finished and we're getting diminish, diminishing marginal returns, I'll try to call it. That's why Zoom is so good now because like you're just sitting there and you're not just making up time. You're really trying to land the plane and get out of there. So if you were going to reflect on the practices that you used when you were managing zero, is there anything that you would do differently at this point? Well, one of the things that we had really well in that role where as a founder, I was able to keep my head up and not get pulled into the day-to-day -day things that had to be done. So I had a very clear matrix of um, you, you know, what our global leadership team did and then what our in-country people did. And I was always managing that the tensions in that matrix to make sure there was always someone to do the jobs. And we had this servant leadership model and then we had, a, um, we had a couple of really good people that kind of ran that system. So they're not, they're not like a PA or anything. I never really had, had any of that support, 
It was more having someone that was really smart, like a right hand person that would that you could just talking to all the time that would actually run those meetings and do the check ins before so that we would, um, you know, we weren't having big controversial discussions in them. We were just trying to get the, um, you know, most things were sort of done in the normal work day. And then you're really trying to focus on what are the things you have to discuss. That's the idea. It never really works out like that. But you're trying to, um, you know, just managing that matrix was probably one of the big things. And having uh, a person, we called them a business manager, but never really found a great title. Maybe in the US, they call it a chief of staff, but that'd be a bit wanky for New Zealand. We'd never be able to get away with that. So, um, you know, having someone that's really smart, um, who can communicate, has the respect of the team that can work alongside you and be making sure that, you know, things are being done and running those meetings. The business worked really well when we had those people in place. So what have you been working on since stepping away from day-to-day -day operations at zero? Yeah, so it takes a while to, when you finish working on a full-time thing like zero, it actually adjust to what life looks like. So the way I thought about it was um, zero was just 24 seven for, um, I think I, I did 12, 14 years. There's no, and there's no time off for good behavior. You're just, even on holiday, you're checking, you know, checking in all the time. And, you know, that has an impact on kids and family. So I kind of figured that, um, that, that, uh, you know, I didn't want to do any other work because if I did, I'd just, do more zero because that's the most fun. But um, I kind of figured that at the end of it, I'd done my career, I compressed it into a smaller amount of time. So what I've been trying to do since zero is not work. And it's really hard to not work. You know, lots of people want to keep, you know, having coffees and talking about their business. And it's like, I've done that. You know, I did that when I was doing zero. So I don't really want to do that now. So I've been trying to do other things. So a lot of um, sort of philanthropic projects and interest projects and doing non-software types of businesses um, has been great. So in Queenstown, very involved with building cycle trail networks and um, ecological restorations around those sort of things. And in New Zealand, especially trying to have an impact in your kind of local place, working on some of the really big um, infrastructure projects. So you know, I'm convinced that our version of Saudi Arabian oil in New Zealand is renewable electricity. So a whole bunch of projects on that. And it's so nice when you don't have like a vested interest, you can just go and, you know, just nudge conversations along over a long period of time. So um, what, I, what I found when we were doing zero is we didn't have a lot of good tool support for managing pr projects. So we'd use Google Sheets and all that sort of stuff. And Google Docs was just, an incredible revelation that you could have people collaborating on things in real time. So rather than having um, serial processes of sending documents around or um, you do a meeting and then a week later, the minutes come out, we're doing everything in real time and collaborating in real time. So I love that, you know, the best probably management tools we had was Google Docs inside the business and, and working in, um, in parallel, not in series. It just drives immediate um, immediacy, and it means like you know minutes are finished as you finish. Everyone have that? Yep, done. So there's no coming back, and uh, then you're really thinking about what are the action points? What are the action points? When you move into the mode I'm in at the moment, like um, kind of where you've got a whole bunch of portfolio of things, personal admin commitments um, that you've made to people, commitments people have paid to you. Like the, what I found was keeping track of those things as a, it has been a real problem. So, um, and that kind of leads into, you know, why we did focus a bit, but that was a, the key thing now is how to just keep track of all those things. Cause you have so many meetings and so much fun and every meeting turns up another two or three opportunities. So that's really the challenge at the moment has been just keeping an eye on, on everything, which is some of it personal, some of it passion, some of it philanthropy, some of the health, just all of those uh, things. So tell us, how do you do it, Rod? What's the secret? Yeah, so um, when about probably eight to nine years ago, or maybe, maybe not that long ago, worked with um, people would know them in New Zealand, Rowan Simpson and Coz, and we built this um, almost like a Trello board of the projects that you're working on. 
and we, we played with it for a while, but I was busy doing stuff. And we were a bit confused about whether it was a team tool or an individual tool. So we kind of built a, built a prototype of this um, planning tool back in the day. And then it kind of died because we weren't quite clear about what it was. Everyone had kind of real jobs to do. And, um, and as I kind of got into this new life and had this problem, I was kind of, man, it would just be good to have just a page where everything was on. And, um, and, that's, um, and, I, and I met Duncan from Southern Software and they were doing some cool stuff. I remember having a coffee with Duncan and saying, look, I played with this tool a while ago and I've thought about it since and I really want it again. And uh, that's what's become focus. And the idea was, you know, essentially on a big screen, I'd call it 27 inches of planning pleasure where you can just get all of your things on at a glance and see all of your projects. And I hate um, doing updates on things or, you know, keeping things up to date. So what's the lightest update you could do and um, so we came up with this model of getting your, um, your projects up there, your tasks up there, and then uh, using a simple red, amber, green model. So you can see what's on track, what's not on track, what's a worry. And you just give things updates. And when you give them an update, you don't have to think about them for a while. So we age them out. And so that, as you, you know, for those that have played with focus, that's what we built with focus. And it's um, just this way to, um, have all of your things and see everything in one page that you're working on across all aspects of your life. So you get to group things in columns, so there's a bit of structure, but essentially you get everything up there, then you give them little updates and you just red, amber, green it, quick update, done. And um, it's not an iPhone app, you didn't want that. It's for sit down in the morning with a coffee every few days and just think of your projects and go, oh, I've forgotten about that one. And what I found was once we got the first prototypes of it working, just the mental relief of getting everything up there and not holding things in your head. I don't know about you guys, but I'd wake up at four in the morning and think about a meeting three weeks ago and I hadn't followed up on it. So being able to get all of those commits and what people have committed to me um, on one page to keep a track of that, I found huge. So um, yeah, that became focus. That's awesome. So I've gotten in the cadence with focus of checking in on Friday mornings and I have that scheduled into my calendar, but I'm curious, when is your time in your week when you reflect on your tasks and see how you're doing with your projects? Yeah. So again, I'm trying really not to work. So what I try to do is like have no meetings in the middle of the day, just in case something interesting happens. So like even with you and I'm like 7am, that's the best time because I'm, I'm probably not riding my bike then. And I get anxiety if someone tries to put a meeting in at 10 or 12. It's like, that's the middle of the day. I might want to go and do something. So I just don't like doing it. Um, so I, I um, you know, quite often sit there with a coffee every few mornings and have a look through. Well, sometimes if I'm not sleeping and I'm stressed at like three in the morning, I'll just get up and get my projects up to date. And then I feel good and I can go back to sleep again. So again, like I was when I was working properly, very random just when I feel like it, but just that feeling of relief, having everything up to date is lovely. One of the big decisions we had, and we're having a good debate about this is, is it a project teams tool? And the problem with, uh, with teams and trying to get them into a, into a tool is we never really had success at that in Xero. We looked at Asana, we looked at all those things. They become too much work, but they just work. And the nature of modern life now is we're all dealing with all sorts of stuff, whether we might have a, an investment property that's got to have work to do, or you've got you know, some, uh, a passion project you're doing and um, some external boards or something. Like you really want to have a focus of, of all of your stuff and have it all in one place. So we thought about making it multi-user, but it actually doesn't work. But we've got a good idea of that, what we think we might do, just sort of talking a little bit um, uh, outside of school is um, actually um, creating cards that you can send to somebody else that you both see, and then you put it in your board with all of your other things. So we're just in love everyone's thought on that, how to, um, if you've got a community that's using focus, not saying, hey, you're all on the same board, but you take an activity and you allow, you, you, have, you have visibility of it, and you can um, give it to somebody else to put in their board and they can have all their other stuff. So you don't see everyone else's things, which allows you to blur your work stuff and all the many projects you're doing. So that's feeling good. 
But what I do do is you can um, put in a, a, a person. So I have a um, really good friend I work with called Chris that does a whole lot of property projects. So I can put uh, on my focus board, put Chris in there, and then I can filter by Chris. So when I'm doing a check-in with him every week, I know all the projects he's working on. Because again, he's not just doing, you know, he's doing some fun passion projects with me and then some real build projects. So um, I get, you know, I'm managing it myself. So it'd be quite cool if I could um, create a card with Chris on it and then he puts it on his board and then he can update it and I would see that. So just working through that with Duncan and the Southern Software team on, on how that works as well. And that's one of the reasons why Focus is free at the moment. It's, um, it feels that it's something that we're kind of working out. And it's a, it's a little bit at this stage, it's a little bit of a gift back, I think. Um, just trying to, you know, trying to build that perfect tool. So really happy to share it and get people to play with it and get their feedback and see if it fits. Because I haven't seen something, you know, other than sort of notes or some of those list managers um, that give you just a beautiful way to get all your, you know, plans in one big screen. I had asked Rod if we could show his focus board for the whole group. And he said, no way. He didn't want everyone to see how the sausage was made. He didn't want to share his secrets. But I wonder, Rod, if you could just tell us what are a couple of those big bucket areas that you're keeping track of right now? Yeah, so a lot of the state, a lot of the um, uh, philanthropy philanthropy projects. So where each of those, the, 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 where each of those are at. Um, I've got another board uh, which is a venture capital board. So you feel like Trello, like Trello. I love Trello because you can do anything in it. But the problem is you can do anything in it. So I love the idea of structured boards. So for a venture capital board, you might have um, a column for prospects things that you're doing due diligence on, things you're invested in and things that you've rejected. So that's very much like Trello where you'll take a card and move it between stages. So um, we've genericized focus enough so it does those sort of things. So if you're like a, like a real estate agent, you might have a bunch of projects and things you're working on and, and you know, that would fit that model and you'd move them across stages. So using columns for stages is quite important. Um, what I use for my main personal board, though, is breaking things into areas. So um, philanthropic projects, investments, uh, building projects, um, car maintenance. Uh, you know, so I've, you know, I've used them that way. But we um, uh, have designed it so it's not as loose as Trello. You can do anything you want, because then you end up doing nothing. But being able to um, think of some, uh, some use cases. So part of the marketing of it will be uh, over the next few months is finding some good verticals. So venture capital and deals is a really uh, good one because it has those stages and each of them work like projects where you're just doing quick updates. So the model seems to work really well for that example as well. We open things up for questions for Q&A with Rod and I'd like to have Duncan. Um, Duncan, can you take it away and, and ask your first questions for Rod? My first question rod is if you're giving if you were giving advice to your younger self uh what would it be don't stop surfing oh and also learn to ride a bmx it comes in um it'd be really relevant later when you're starting to learn jumps in your 50s love it yeah. love it i think um i think a key one is um i remember when i went to the states uh very early on in my career in in the 90s and um i didn't know anybody and there were um, there wasn't much to do, and I found in the place I was staying there was one of those plastic books with like twelve cassette tapes in it, and um, and I thought oh that's kind of interesting. It was like a self improvement thing. Can't remember what it was, but there's two takeaways I took from it. One is you can be an expert in anything in six months, and I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. And the way you do that is by um, you know just reading everything you can about a subject. So um, I got onto news feeds really early, like even wrote my own RSS reader when blogs first sort of came out. But I've been, I used Feedly at the, um, Feedly, which was, I think there was Google Reader, they dropped that and Feedly is the one I use at the moment. So basically, and for years, every bit of tech news that's ever come out with, you know, tech meme and those things, I've pretty much seen it. So you end up over years picking up 
patterns that you understand. So you see a business that, um, that you know, you go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And then one that goes, actually, that sounds a bit dodgy. It's three or four months later, they might go out of business or something like that. But over the course of years, you just see these patterns. So you just um, develop this experience, which feels like instinct, but it's just experience where you've just seen everything and you kind of, things either fit your mental model and you go, yep, that builds my picture or you see something that doesn't fit. So that either raises warning bells or moves your model in a new direction. So um, defining the areas that you're interested in, subscribing to those services and over a few months, you'll, you'll just develop expertise. Then you might start commenting on things. You might start writing articles. Then you get invited to go and speak at a conference. You meet the experts. And it's amazing on the internet, you can talk to your heroes. I mean, you know, I've been a um, huge fan of Anne for years and years. And then uh, now, you know, I'm on, a, I'm on um, a webinar with her. You actually get to meet people globally from anywhere in the world who are into the same sort of stuff that you're in. So you can quite quickly become a global expert. And the joy of a global expert is you get to interact with people that you, that you have things in common with. And you can be right at the heart of the world doing this sort of stuff and as we're starting to travel again you can meet people at conferences and and build those deep relationships so so there's something thanks rod the next question is from laura nickel hi laura um when you were growing zero how did you get cross-department collaboration working for uh, at scale and how did you make sure people understood their purpose and impact relevant to the to the plan yeah, so cross department collaboration is really um, uh, is a really tough thing to do as businesses get bigger. So in founder led organisations, and in that role that um, I had, not having day to day work, um, you'd be always gluing and connecting the dots across businesses, trying to get show and tells from each thing, and then um, being very focused on outcomes. And as you get bigger you have to, the, a lot of the projects become cross team projects. So you kind of got to have um, people that are focused on outcomes that um, can do the hustling internally to work across. And I've noticed as, as we've, as at zero, we've moved from being less founder led to being more uh, traditional corporate. That's something we've always got to work on. Um, but if you've got a founder or you, uh, as you get bigger, you hire, um, people that can operate um, very outcome focused and will go and, and work across teams because significant projects usually are cross team projects. So um, I think the big answer for that is making sure you've got people that have got the capacity and the relationship skills to be able to operate across team and can drive an output culture um, to your work products. Awesome. Next question is from Glenn Senior. What, hey, Glenn. What, uh, what were Zero's two main speed growth wobbles and what did you do to solve them? Um, I think uh, one of the biggest dynamics we had was the move from being a kind of Australasian company to a global company. And the difference between trying to build an Australasian business of scale is... Um, most big global tech businesses are, um, you know, are US centric. So they'll have a traditional hierarchical command and control structure. So and two, it's a really good example, right? Awesome company, a formidable competitor. But one of the big difference we had is um, if you look at who we were competing with in each market, they would have like a CEO, a bunch of presidents. They'll have a like like a like a head of revenue, a head of sales, and a head of international. And by the time you get to a country manager, they're like five levels deep in the organization, which be a mid-level salespeople person in our business. So what we had to do was to create a really flat matrix structure, which allowed us to hire great people in each country. And then, um, and you can't, you know, if I want to hire a really senior person to run the US or the UK, they're not, they don't want to be five levels down in the organization. So you've got to come up with a, a matrix approach that actually works, which is some uh, something that we did. And another principle of um, in that, you know, one is servant leadership, so defining what each 
cell in each row and column in the matrix does for each other and the mechanisms for managing those servant leadership contracts, but also the concept of um, polymorphism where any place in the world can be a center of excellence. And that's really hard to release the reins to actually take a, a, a function and put it in each and put it in each market. So each country should have something that they are the global head in. Um, and that's an ongoing uh, management uh, challenge um, that you have to do. And it's different to how a, a US global corporate would be. And as we've got bigger, one of our challenges is how do we become you know, that, 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 that global entity. So I think that's a unique challenge for global companies that come from smaller places. Thank that's you. One, that's one big one, so that counts as two, Glenn. <laughs> uh, next question there from Ryan Dugard. Uh, do you try or, sorry, do you track or try to balance your time between your different areas of focus or is it more peaks and troughs? I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm intrigued. Yes. Yeah, no, you do. So, um, yeah, it's all, it's actually, as I get interested, like I do have anxiety now about, I remember Sam Morgan one day came to me and he showed me his diary. So Sam was the founder of Trade Me and um, they did really well, like 14 years ago, selling their business for a huge amount of money. And so he went and invested in a whole lot of things and got really, really busy on a whole bunch of different projects. And I remember about two years later, he came and he showed me his, um, his diary and on his phone. He was going, look, nothing, nothing, look, nothing, 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 nothing. I got nothing. And um, he'd actually spent two years getting nothing in his diary. And um, uh, so I'm a little bit the same where you don't wanna, if I wanted to work, I'd still be doing zero. So you actually try not to do much. And sometimes I forget how to work. Like you forget how to calendar. So, so like if, if somebody says, let's have a meeting, if you don't send me a calendar invite, I won't be there because I would have gone straight out of my head. I think you've found that, Duncan. So, um, uh, so yeah, very much peaks and troughs and trying to create clear space where you don't actually have to do work. So I try to just want to have a moment of motivation. I'll jump in and, and uh, do some things, but I really try to do as little as possible. And one more question from myself. Um, and if anyone else has got a question, stick it in the chat. The question from me, Rod, is you've seen a lot of startups come and go over, over your time. What would be the common trend that you see with startups that are failing? Um, well, the common trend is that they're failing. Um, so startups are really hard. And um, it's like... I. Um, Ideas are easy. You can just create ideas like that. It's actually execution and getting stuff done. And a lot of things have been done before um, or tried before. And there's a, a really pattern that's hard. Like um, if you're building, you know, most, most businesses are two-sided. You need, uh, you know, you need to be able to get product and make product or, and you need to get customers as well. There's, um, uh, you know, it's hard usually one, one half of it is really difficult and it might, might be an incumbent that's already there. And the challenge of doing that is absolutely huge. So I think an important thing at the beginning is being able to test your idea um, with, with real people and um, get the reality of that straight away before you waste too much time. So the numbers are, you know, 99.999% of startups don't get there. So if you are going to get there, you're exceptional. And um, you hate seeing people wasting 50 or 100 grand and not getting paid for two years while they're doing something. But that doesn't mean they're bad ideas. It just means you should, um, you know, just be very cautious and test the hell out of it and talk to people that can tell you, okay, this is the really hard bit and see if you can prove the hard bit first. I get a lot of people just saying, hey, um, let's catch up for coffee. I want to tell you an idea. I'm like, I don't want to hear your idea. I really don't want to hear it. Um, so I say, well, can you um, put it onto like a one pager? Probably less than 5% of people ever come back. So, you know, for getting an idea onto a piece of paper and then the next step after that, if they actually are, um, get to that point, then the next task you'll give them, which filters them out again. Okay, well, let's 
that's really good. Let's see your presentation deck. And a presentation deck should have things like um, the competitive um, analysis, because most people are saying, oh, it's like Uber for tattooists. Okay, got it, you know. And, and you can see, okay, those, if you want to see that all the big competitors that a normal person would see are in that deck. So the person understands the market that they're operating. That's a massive validation that they're realistic about what they're doing. So you really want to, before approaching someone like me, you want to have like a really crisp summary of, of, of what it is. And being able to write something in a very crisp way is such a, te a touch a test. If you can actually get that summary in a clear way that you're actually interested, that's great. And then getting that really short um, pitch deck, because no one wants to read a deck but, and I don't want to see 50 pages. I just want to get the idea as quick as possible. And more often than not, it may be something that you may not want to invest in, but you just can't be bothered, but it might be something you know somebody who would be useful for that business or might want to invest. And then you can forward it on quite quickly and say, hey, here's some good people quite good idea, you might like it. So I'll very much try to uh, make an introduction if I can, because that's easy and it adds value. Um, but you've got, it's gotta be a really credible document that's forwardable. forwardable. Um, so that's, hopefully that's a good tip. I don't know if I answered the question, but hopefully that was useful. No, great, great answer. Um, probably the most important question coming here from Glenn is what is your favorite bike trail in Queenstown? Uh, well, I'm, I'm riding at nearly gnarly quite a lot. That's 50 something jumps in a row, which is awesome. I will look forward to seeing the video. Yeah, there's one up. I put it up this morning. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, Kim Harvey, do you mentor business people? And if you do, and if you did, uh, what would you look for? Hell no. I can't think of anything more tiring. In case you haven't noticed, Rod's quite open and honest when it comes to answering yeah. questions. No, no, because <laughs> once, once you've done work, you don't want to go back and do more of it. So there are some people that manage to get through and it's kind of interesting. And like I'll do a group thing like this every so often, but like you don't want to fill your time up. And if you do two or three of them, then that's half a week gone. So that's, um, you know, I've done, I've done it, done software. And I'm much more interested in... Um, you know, sort of environmental projects and things like that, or things with a bit of purpose um, that you kind of peak, you want to do things that, that you have a personal interest in now. Um, and there's, there's a whole industry around software and SaaS, and there's people that are at their career where they get, they, they want to build their profile and they're active and they're doing it. So you kind of want to align into those people. So there's some great execs at zero. There's some great businesses in our ecosystem that have done SaaS. Um, so, and there are people right in there. They're doing events. They want to talk to people. So that's the that's the timing. Once you've kind of through it, like you've kind of done it, and um, and you're just very careful about time. Like I want to have time with kids. I want to have time at the beach, and and actually do those things that I didn't do when I didn't have time to do when I was working. And Ryan's asking, um, when you were talking about focus, you talked about how you worked across many things at, um, at the same time. Um, he's asking, and you also mentioned about that feeling of anxiety. Have you looked at the psychological aspects of building the focus tool um, for a particular user and how you can meet their needs? Yeah, we did an amazing study with a whole lot of PhDs and everyone said it's mandatory that you should have it. Yeah, <laughs> love it. <laughs> it is about creating that that calming experience, right? So, so like even from a user in, interface perspective, getting rid of all the noise and all the BS that other tools yeah. have. I mean, you know, you just you, there's some things you just that are instinctual, and like we've known about writing things down is useful. I just wanted a really, I wanted a bit of tool support and something I could use my 27 inch monitor on and see everything. So. And I, and I felt the ex like, like it was such a tangible experience. We talked about this, didn't we, Duncan, when we did it, once we could actually, once we had enough functionality that it worked, just that huh, of um, having everything up there. So the yeah, exhaustive research and everyone agrees it's, it's amazing. Okay, from Sebastian Chapman, um, apparently one of the best mountain bikers in Queenstown and a good software developer. 
Hey Rod, in the early days of Zero, uh, were you more involved with being on the tools, or have you always been able to um, be at a higher level and connect the dots? Um, yeah, if I kind of um, mentioned a little bit of that when we started, because Zero, we listed it in our first year, like we were like the smallest ever revenue public company ever in the world. Um, the, like I was out raising money. So Craig and Fletch and Philip and Catherine were in the in an apartment 404 writing the software. The one before Aftermail, I did write a small amount of code for that, but it was a bit similar. And the one before that, I did write code in it. Um, but I just didn't have time. I was working on the business. So it was a really uh, weird thing not to be on the tools. Um, but uh, it was also super fun getting out there and learning how the markets work. So I had no idea how public companies work before we did zero, but it's a system. And, you know, as, as software people, you tend to think and you tend to be very good at systems theory and working out how it works. So um, I remember when we started it, it was like, um, uh, you know, part of it was actually, was actually hacking the public company aspects. And I really liked that. Um, so uh, we kind of realized, and I you know, put a lot of time into applying systems thinking into how public companies worked and venture capital worked and all of those things. So as well as building a cool product, it was super fun learning um, how to do a public company. And it was just sport. I really enjoyed the process of that. And, uh, and it was amazing. You know, it, what, what was cool was having, and this was so new, having capital allows you to execute strategy. And we weren't like raising a hundred grand, you know, our first public raise was 15 million. And I remember um, working with Ross Jenkins, our CFO, we raised a hundred million one weekend. And then probably about six months later, we raised 180 over a weekend. It was awesome. And uh, that, you know, and like, I remember when Ross, said uh, a few years ago, like 10 years ago, probably that our budget was like, you know, we we're going to spend $50 million in the year. I was like, what the hell are we taking? We, we'd be sending someone into space. How can we spend $50 million? And, um, you know, now we're just sort of approaching a hundred million a month in revenue. So we're probably spending like a hundred million a month, uh, I, I would imagine. So, um, you know, the scale of things just gets bigger and bigger and get more and more comfortable with it but I just love that capital allows you to execute strategy. And then your next constraint is finding amazing people to, to go in and, uh, and be part of building the, building the machine. Thank you. And the last question is from Scott. How do you push through procrastination? Do I push through what? Proca yes. I haven't got my teeth in this morning. Procrastination. How I thought you said uh... fascination. I thought that was an interesting question. <laughs> um, well, I think we all procrastinate, but sometimes, you know, you actually, if you forget to pay the bills, then you've actually, they start sending you angry letters. So it's like, oh, shit, I gotta go and do that. So yeah, I kind of, um, yeah, I'm a procrastinator. There's always something else better to do than sit down and do work. So um, uh, just getting little systems for things. Like well, I spend so much of my time paying bills and it's so frustrating how bad mobile banking is that you keep copying, pasting, copying, pasting on a phone. Someone sends your bank accounts wrongly formatted. So I've kind of, you know, I just keep hacking workflows to do that. So my workflow for bills is I have a label in Gmail called paid. And as soon as I pay it, I've hit the label paid. So I know that I've paid it. The tip for everybody. And, um, uh, and like that's one of the big ones. I'll put them off and then I'll go back and think, you know, I'll think about them and then I forget about them immediately. And then someone nags me and I've got to go and pay a bill. So I'm always procrastinating and, and it's actually bills are probably the cycle. I'll sit down and do some work. Then I'll go and look at all my starred messages and go, oh, shit, I was meant to get back on that one. So I'm a total procrastinator um, and I'd rather do anything else but work. But, um, uh, you know, a few little hacks like that make it work and you just have to get these productive times where you get things done. And that's why, you know, we built Focus was because um, it just allows you to put all those things. So that part of your life and the commits you've made and commitments others have made to you, there's a place to just record them in a really lightweight way. 
So Rod, why Perfect. aren't you just spending um, your days relaxing on a beach somewhere? Why are you still staying so busy? Well, be, um, because, um, so that is a good idea, but you actually do need that mental stimulation as well. And you also want to do the give back stuff too. And um, the other thing of having um, you know, quite a bit of money is you need to put it to work. And um, uh, so you've got to actually be responsible around the outcomes you get from doing it. So what are the good things you can do? How do you look after it? So it just becomes all this admin. No one tells you about that. There's a whole lot of admin to do with this sort of stuff. And uh, so you do need you know, some tools to make it happen. So um, I think most smart entrepreneurial people can't do nothing. So you just have um, uh, intensive relaxation. You know, I'm relaxing now, I'm relaxing hard, I'm relaxing harder than anyone else. Okay, I'm done. And then you're on to some work, you know. Love it. Thanks, Rod. I will hand back over to Anne. In the chat, you'll see that I dropped in there the link for you to sign up for Focus. It is currently a free tool. And when you sign up for Focus, you will get to enjoy a periodic newsletter where we let you know when we have cool events going on. Um, also, we're really active on everywhere where you get your internet um, social media. So please join us there. We have a few videos on YouTube of how we use Focus. Um, I've been posting a lot of charts and graphs over on Instagram. Uh, so I do hope that you join our community and continue to engage with us. And thank you so much for joining today. Thanks for all of that. And uh, thanks for people being interested. And thanks, Anne. Nice to see you.